very special occasion for a lot of reasons. Uh, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication is proud to inaugurate this new speaker series in the name of Jean and Marjorie Chamberlain from Ames, right over here. So give them a round of applause. Our, our inaugural speakers uh, are two of the country's most outstanding journalists, Sandy Johnson, who's the bureau chief for the Associated Press, and Chuck Rosh, political editor for the Gannett News Service. And you'll learn more about them from Brian Cooper, who is our Chamberlain Fellow, who also will be introduced by Jennifer Assa of the Iowa Newspaper Foundation. Tonight, we are celebrating the importance of news in democratic society, uh, especially in an election year. Uh, before we begin our program, I, I, I do want to make a, a few acknowledgments and to thank uh, a few people for helping to set this up. Uh, we deeply appreciate the support of the Chamberlains, but I also want to thank, thank the Iowa Newspaper uh, Foundation for its support, along with the Leo Morris chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists and the Iowa State Daily and the Iowa State Lectures Program. I'd also like to thank my colleague who is desperately looking for a laptop, David Bula, and Dennis Chamberlain, who are co-chairs of our First Amendment Committee, along with members Barbara Mack, Dick Doak, David Saldana, John Thomas, Shelley Rouse, and all who helped coordinate this event with Mark Witherspoon at the Daily and Kathy Box and Kim Curl at the Greenlee School. As you can see, tonight's Chamberlain Lecture is a hallmark for the fall semester in advance of homecoming this month, and it's a special homecoming for many of us gathered here tonight. The Chamberlains are graduates of Iowa State University, but they were also publishers of the Mobage Tribune in South Dakota and active at South Dakota State's journalism program. I am a graduate of that program, as are three of the 12 chairs and directors of what is now the Greenlee School. That includes Tom Emerson, whose news writing lab I inherited at SDSU, and Jake Vistendahl, who was the department chair in the 1970s and 80s at ISU. Some of our finest professors in the journalism program at ISU also were South Dakota State graduates, including Bill Kunerth and the late great teacher Ed Blinn. Also in the audience tonight is someone very special uh, to, to us, uh, Dick Lee, former chair of the uh, journalism department at SDSU, he's over here in the front, who knows how special our generation of journalists was in the mid-1970s. In addition to Sandy Johnson and Chuck Rosh, distinguished alumni from our alma mater, we graduated such journalists as Tina Anderson, now Haroldson, AP Bureau Manager for the Dakotas, a position that I held in the 1970s for United Press International, and Melanie Rigney, former UPI Central Division Chief in Chicago. Many of us had so much zeal that we went from SDSU straight into the wire service, which was the Marine Corps of the journalism. Uh, camp, the few, the proud, the wire service reporters. <laughs> Today I spoke with Mary Arnold, who is the current chair of the jur journalism department at South Dakota State, about graduates of both programs and the special relationship that Iowa State shares with our alma mater. She says, quote, it's kind of spooky, uh, but we both share a proud tradition and bright future because excellence in writing is at the core of almost everything we do. And that includes upholding standards, even when teaching technology in the Converged Newsroom or uh, Information Center, as it were. Also consider this. There's something about a land-grant institution that reminds journalists that we serve the public, that this is our special calling, and that democracy depends on it. Thank you. Jennifer. Good evening. The Iowa Newspaper Foundation is honored to be a partner in the inaugural Chamberlain Lecture Program. These types of educational programs are vital to the future of our industry and are important for build, building positive connections between professional journalism, journalists and students. We are also very proud to have Brian Cooper of the Dubuque Telegraph Herald represent the Iowa Newspaper Foundation this week as the Chamberlain INF Fellow. Brian has been the Telegraph Herald executive editor since 1986 and has overall responsibility for the editorial product, news, features, sports, opinion, and photography. He has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Brian is an officer of the Iowa Newspaper Foundation Board of Directors 
and a past president of the Iowa Freedom of Information Council. Brian's biography of Dubuque County native Urban Red Faber, a Hall of Fame pitcher for the Chicago White Sox, was published recently by McFarland and Company. It is my pleasure to introduce Brian Cooper. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, one uh, addition to that introduction, I'm also in charge of the comics, which seems to con consume a lot of my time these days when you uh, are running the comic page, too. Um, I would like to um, add my uh, thanks to the Chamberlains for uh, sponsoring this program. I think it's outstanding, and I'm very proud to be the uh, inaugural Chamberlain Fellow. It's my uh, pleasure this evening to be able to introduce not one but two guest speakers, and uh, I have a, a little overview, and then uh, we'll get into the introductions. Uh, there are 1,500 daily newspapers in the United States, and precious few of them, in fact none, have the resources to place their own reporters in Washington, New York, and other key places around the world. Instead, our newspapers subscribe to wire services. We're members of the Associated Press and, and other wire services, and that's where our two guest speakers come in. Sandy Johnson is the Associated Press Bureau Chief in Washington, and Chuck Roche is National Political Correspondent and Columnist for Gannett News Service, serving the uh, Gannett newspapers uh, across the country. Their news decisions and their reports go out to hundreds of newspapers and thus hundreds of of thousands of readers. They have tremendous influence over what information Americans receive and thus, to a degree, how public opinion can be shaped. As an editor working in the heartland, I have to trust the AP. I'm sure that the Gannett editors feel likewise about the Gannett News Service. Are they reporting the news fairly and objectively? Are they pursuing the right stories? Are they missing anything? We are essentially powerless from hundreds of miles away to check up on these folks, so we have to have inherent trust on what they do. Our speakers this evening are married to each other and have been so for 28 years. Uh, that's a remarkable achievement, just ask my wife. Um, and when you add to the fact that they both are involved in high-level jobs in journalism, I think that's uh, quite an achievement. They have two college-age sons. Both uh, are outstanding students, but have not followed their parents' career track into journalism. Um, as mentioned uh, previously by uh, Michael, Chuck and Sandy are graduates of South Dakota State University. Uh, our first speaker will be Sandy Johnson. And uh, let's hit the rewind button uh, for some of us that are a little long in the tooth. Some of you students maybe covered this in history, but let's say it's the year 2000. Um, it's a tense and crazy and historic election night. It appears that George Bush has pulled out a close election over Al Gore for the US presidency. The projection is based on the projections mostly from Florida, where the vote differences in some precincts are incredibly small. So the TV networks, which earlier that evening had to rescind some of their calls on who won which state, are declaring Bush the winner. Newspaper editors across the country, bumping against their deadlines, are watching all that on TV. But there is a problem. The AP is not calling the election for Bush. Where in the blank is the AP story declaring Bush the winner? We've got to go to press. What's the problem here? The problem is Sandy Johnson, our speaker this evening. As bureau chief, she, held, uh, she has the responsibility of determining and deciding how the major election story is written. Against great pressure from editors and news directors from all over the country, she refuses to call the outcome of the Bush-Gore race. Based on what she knows about Florida voting trends, she is not convinced that Bush has won the state, and thus the presidency. It would have been easy for her to follow the pack and figure, hey, if we're wrong, at least we're all wrong. Though she uh, confuses and angers uh, editors uh, uh, who subscribe to the AP, the members of the AP, including yours truly, she sticks to what she thought was right, and she was right. It took a Supreme Court decision to settle the matter in the following month. Her members of the AP got over it. 
the Associated Press Managing Editors subsequently presented Sandy Johnson with the group's presidential award for her courage and her judgment. By the way, this is Sandy's first trip to Iowa in almost two decades, and uh, we hope that uh, you will give a fine Iowa welcome to Sandy Johnson. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you for inviting us to Ames. Um, the uh, little bit of whispering over in the corner was we're trying to get a nice little photo slideshow set up. And Brian, if you would just hit the, I think, the center button. We'll see if we can get this thing to work. It looks great on We here. may need some technical help. <laughs> Is there an enter button? <laughs> well, it was a valiant effort, let's put it that way. Maybe we can get it to work later. Um, Chuck and I are honored and touched to be the first Chamberlain speakers. Jean and Margie Chamberlain have devoted their lives to journalism and your right to know. They helped dozens of young college students with summer jobs and scholarships. Chuck and I had friends from SDSU who spent their summer in Mobridge learning from them. In the early 1990s, they performed a public service worthy of a Pulitzer. Thirteen weekly newspapers in North Dakota went belly up, and the Chamberlains did a wild and crazy thing. They stepped into a financial black hole and nursed those newspapers back to health. Thanks to their act of generosity, those small communities still have the lifeblood of a newspaper, and now the Chamberlains have returned to Iowa, and they are still giving. They are an example for us all. As a matter of fact. Well, I've been involved in politics since college, and I've been running AP's presidential coverage since 1988. So my heart is with Iowa and New Hampshire, and the ongoing scrap or squabble over who goes first. Iowa may not look like America, as everybody likes to point out, but it's hard to beat your genuine interest in politics. Voter turnout here was a whopping 69% four years ago. In New Hampshire, it was 72%. In South Carolina, which would like to steal your thunder, they had the third lowest turnout in the nation. So I don't know who they think they are. <laughs> I know a woman who grew up here and had the quintessential Iowa political experience. Carol Cox grew up in Fort Dodge and graduated from this fine university in 1982. Then she did the grassroots political thing. She chauffeured the 1984 presidential candidates from one event to another. Gary Hart, Walter Mondale, other Democrats, they all rode around north central Iowa in Carol's brown cutlass supreme. And she still talks about that as an amazing ex education. One of AP's reporters, Mike Glover, logs 15,000 miles a year covering the caucuses uh, in Iowa from north, south, east, west. Let me take a minute to salute Mike and AP's hardworking staff in Iowa. Under Carol Ria's direction, their stories in the presidential campaign appear literally around the globe. It is AP's good fortune to have such a strong crew here. I have to tell you, it's intimidating to talk to an Iowa audience about presidential politics. Nobody follows politics more closely than you do. So I thought I'd try to give you a bit of a national viewpoint since you've got the grassroots angle down cold. It's in, oh, we got the slideshow working? No? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right, well, let's take a minute. These are photos taken mostly here in Iowa, so look for your friends and family members. There's music, but I won't torture this anymore.
Picture's worth a thousand words. Thank you for getting that to work. <laughs> so I was saying, <laughs> um, it's important to remember that this race is not just a horse race. It's the election of the single most powerful person in the world. He, or perhaps she, can start wars. They can affect the economy across the world. The election process does not end on November 4th, 2008. It's a kickoff to a new presidency and all the change that will follow. What we learn about the candidates in 2008 will shape how we cover the new president in 2009. Having said that, it is a guilty pleasure to see who's up and who's down in the polls. On the Democratic side, don't bet the farm that Hillary will be the nominee. She appears to be comfortably ahead nationally for now. Some are even using the word inevitable. But the conventional wisdom can be, can be wrong. At this point, four years ago, everybody thought Howard Dean had Iowa locked up. And just two months ago, John McCain was near death. The pundits screwed up again. And she has to win Iowa, which has not been kind to women running for high office. Hillary Clinton does have some big advantages nationally. Money, name ID, money, organization, money. So either she fumbles on her own or Barack Obama and John Edwards have to shake up the dynamic somehow. It doesn't help that Mrs. Obama said last week that he has to win Iowa or the dream dies here. I bet that led to some lively pillow talk that evening. And did you all know that Iowa is recruiting cool kids in Iowa high schools to be Barack stars? Get it? Barack stars? The campaign thinks these cool kids can help turn out the youth vote on caucus night. That's a gamble because young voter turnout has been poor in the past. John Edwards needs a strong showing here because he's faring even worse elsewhere in the early states. He's accepted the restrictions of federal financing, which will tie his hands with rules when he needs the most flexibility after Iowa. One wag suggested he take the $400 haircuts off the table by going to an old-fashioned barbershop here in Iowa for a $5 buzz cut. <laughs> the dynasty question is nagging at some voters. We, we ran a uh, census analysis last week and found that 4 in 10 Americans have not lived in a time when there wasn't a Bush or Clinton president or vice president. Eight years of Hillary would probably make that half the population. I'm sure the other candidates ask themselves every day, what's so special about being a Bush or a Clinton? Uh, they're not exactly Roosevelt's and Kennedy's, and there are 300 million other Americans after all. Fred Thompson appears to have peaked before he even announced his candidacy. He doesn't really like the retail game, and his staff is trying hard to hide that from you. And they're making some pretty silly mistakes. They sent him to a couple sports bars in New Hampshire during a Patriots game. They apparently didn't know that you do not interrupt the church of Tom Brady on Sundays. Thompson was trying to shake hands, and people were yelling, down in front, and get out of here. Poor New England accent. Romney is a robo-candidate, making six or seven appearances a day. That is an amazing pace. And his children apparently do not mind if he spends their in inheritance. He's loaned his campaign $9 million and will write a check for more if needed. Rudy Giuliani and his New York aides know the Godfather movies by heart. They can quote entire sections of dialogue. He's so obsessed with opera that he started an opera club in high school, and his campaign was the only one to issue a statement when Pavarotti died. The Giuliani crowd is as uptight about message discipline as the Bush White House. We took a photograph of Giuliani getting paked for can or pancake for TV with his staff's okay, and then they spent hours trying to get us to take the photograph down after the candidate went ballistic. He has this famous temper that the New Yorkers are very familiar with, and you all haven't seen yet. I've seen a lot of change over 20 years of presidential coverage, and the biggest catalyst, I think, is YouTube. That's a cheap answer, but YouTube is symbolic of a larger phenomenon that has been a painful awakening to the news business. Back in the day, there were three channels on TV, ABC, NBC, and CBS. If you're nodding your head, you're dating yourself. <laughs> now there are hundreds of cable choices, in the old days, you got your newspaper in the morning or afternoon, more likely, most likely printed a couple miles down the road. 
Now the internet lets you choose any newspaper website you want anywhere in the world. Or perhaps you skip the traditional news sites completely and get your information from Yahoo or one of the 14 million blogs out there or Jon Stewart who is a comedian. So no longer do the newspaper editors and television producers decide solely what is news. You get to choose by dialing through the cacophony and picking your news vendor of choice. The news business, our bosses, were criminally negligent by ignoring the power of the internet. Just like radio in its day, news executives thought the internet was a fad. Boy, were they wrong. Now we're scrambling to compete with YouTube and the blogs. There's an economic theory for all this. It's called creative destruction. In a nutshell, you snooze, you lose, or innovate or die. It is our sincere hope that intelligent people will continue to want a balanced and objective framework for the campaign and for local news and for the war in Iraq. We know the war has taken a terrible toll here. 46 Iowans killed in Iraq. A third of these soldiers were in the National Guard or Reserves, the so-called weekend warriors called to duty. The casual reports which we, uh, which we categorize in a database are terribly sad. Killed in a Chinook helicopter shot down over Fallujah. Killed by enemy fire in Ambar. Killed when explosives hit an armored vehicle near Ramadi. These foreign sounding places, Fallujah and Umm Qasr and Mosul, are this generation's version of Normandy and Inchon and Quezon. We have lost journal or colleagues too in the journalism business. More than 100 journalists have been killed trying to bring the news to you from Iraq. An Iraqi working as an AP cameraman was shot in the back of the head execution style a few months ago. And have you noticed, there are very few photos or video from the battlefield in Iraq. You see images of marketplace mayhem and killings in Baghdad, but frankly, you saw more battlefield images from Vietnam than you're seeing, seeing from Iraq. That's because it's too dangerous to travel to the front unilaterally without a military escort. And if you go with a military escort, there are restrictions on what you can take pictures of. Think about this statistic. Last week, we sent 225 campaign photographs from Iowa and New Hampshire. By comparison, we moved just 37 photographs showing bloodshed from Iraq, and none of them were from the front. 50 years from now, when the next Ken Burns or Stephen Ambrose tries to produce a documentary on the Iraq war, there will be shockingly few images during, of this war, especially during the later years. In this light, it is a marvel that 18 men and a woman want to be president because the winner will surely inherit this war on January 20th, 2009. I know they all have carefully scripted answers about what they will do about Iraq, but reality will be very different from talking about it, and I hope they've read their history books. We just returned from Parents Weekend at our younger son's college. Part of our jobs as parents is to attend boring lectures during Parents Weekend so you students can sleep in. But the career counseling director had my attention. He talked about how the goal of college for many decades was to give young people the, the opportunity to develop a philosophy of life. He bemoaned that college has become more of a cost-benefit analysis, how to get a big salary job after four years. And he had this marvelous factoid. There are 22,741 occupations to choose from. To the students here, my advice is to choose a career that is fun and interesting with salary as a secondary factor. Believe me, if you're going to spend 50 or 60 hours a week at work, you should be passionate about what you're doing. I'll turn this over to Chuck on a lighter note. Since 1992, AP has asked the presidential candidates some trivia questions, such as, what is your hidden talent? Barack Obama says it's his poker game. Hillary Clinton says she's a whiz at crossword puzzles. Sam Brownback says it's his auctioneering skill. And John McCain says he grills a mean rack of baby back ribs, hopefully raised right here in Iowa. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Sandy. I was sitting there trying to think what my hidden talent was, and I can't come up with a darn thing. So. Um, our, our second speaker tonight is uh, Chuck Rosh, and um, I have one message for the bosses of Gannett News Service. Send this guy to Hawaii. Uh, Chuck has filed bylines from 49 states, every state but Hawaii, and uh, I don't know, it, it just seems as if uh, that would be some injustice if he doesn't somehow have a Honolulu dateline uh, in the near future. Uh, in addition, Chuck has also filed reports from four different continents. If the uh, Guinness Book of Records keeps track of these things, Chuck might claim the one-day record for experiencing the widest temperature variation. He re uh, shared with me that while reporting for USA Today, he moved from one assignment in Yuma, Arizona, where it was 85 degrees, to International Falls, Minnesota, where the same day it was 35 below zero. And he wasn't anticipating the Minnesota trip, as his expense report for $350 in warm clothing would attest. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Chuck is a native of South Dakota, and he has covered political campaigns for nearly 30 years. Uh, he comes uh, to Iowa State uh, on, on this uh, program, uh, but it's not his first time being uh, recognized by a university. He is a former Knight Fellow at Stanford University. Please welcome Chuck Rosh. Good evening. Thank you, Brian, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I was telling Sandy earlier today, there's nothing like being on a college campus in the fall with um, uh, you know, the trees starting to turn and the weather getting crisp, although it's been a little bit soggy the last couple of days. And I think I even caught, after the weather cleared tonight, a, a little whiff of that uh, big football win over the Hawkeyes. So <laughs> I want a second to thanks to the Chamberlains, whose uh, generosity in this moment is touching. Um, for all the challenges that we talk about in the newspaper business these days, uh, the Chamberlains remind us that what it means when newspapers are pillars in a community. And I will hear, I will hear to, I'm here to, tonight to say that Jefferson had it right when he said that if left with a choice between government and newspapers, he'd choose newspapers. Although I'm sure there are a lot of editors on certain days he would not make that choice on. Um, you know, there's always something right and good about being in Iowa in the middle of the presidential campaign, although I don't know exactly what the middle is anymore in a perpetual campaign. And um, one wonders what Thomas Jefferson would have actually thought about a professional political campaign that seems now to stretch out into perpetuity, that lasts years before elections. And I'm convinced that someday anthropologists and, and geneticists are going to come back and find out that Iowans and New Hampshire, it's in the late 20th and early 21st century, developed a special turnoff gene uh, that allows you to shut things off when really you want to. But if you ever actually doubt Iowa's passion for politics, just take a look at the uh, bumper stickers you see. And I think you probably see them, and, and you see so many of them after a while. But I actually saw one on campus today I've never actually seen before, and that is, um, if I can get it correctly, it was, uh, I'm for caribou and I vote. <laughs> anyway. Um, you know, I'm not sure how long Iowa can or should hold its poll position. Uh, that's a debate for another time. But it is reassuring to see the serious, steady way Iowans go about the caucuses. And certainly in this uh, coming election, the country is going to need all the steadiness that it, uh, that it can get. Uh, trying to make sense of an 18-person presidential campaign is kind of reminds me of the old story about the um, three political reporters who went turkey hunting. And uh, they pulled up and saw a turkey, and the first one shot and missed right. second one shot and missed left, and the third one said, you got it. Anyway, um, <laughs> it takes a while to sink in. That's kind of what it feels like covering a presidential campaign these days. Uh, it's like shooting at a moving target from a speeding truck. But there are a number of certain facets of this campaign, which I think we can outline with certainty, that make this different from any other political campaign, and that is... Um, first, we're looking at, a, at an outline that's 180 degrees different from the normal situation. Uh, usually, it's the Republicans that have a front runner by now, and everybody else is chasing him, and it's always been a him. Um, and it's usually the Democrats that are scrambling around, you know, and, and trying to figure out who's, who's up and who's down and who's not. 
And the opposite is actually happening this time around with, uh, with what's going on with, uh, with Hillary, although I agree that you know, it's not foregone that she's going to be the nominee. It certainly looks like it today. And on the Republican side, I can tell you, I have no idea who's going to be the nominee. And if anybody here knows, I'd like to talk to you about it afterwards because uh, you know, it seems to me more of a field that's defined by trying to fill the shoes of the late Ronald Reagan, and uh, none of them have yet. So. Uh, beyond this point, I think there are six other uh, fixed aspects of this coming presidential campaign that I believe make it historic and hugely consequential. Um, we always say this, but this is, it's really, really true this time. Even if you're 18 years old and voting for the first time, this could be one of the most, if not the most important presidential election in, in, um, in your lifetime. Uh, it's certainly, I think, the most important presidential life, uh, election since I've been covering politics, presidential politics in 1988. Uh, and we had some real snoozers in there, by the way, 1996 included. But um, then, as I said, there are six facets. The first one is, unless dramatic change occurs, it will, this will be the first election since 1972 that takes place during an unpopular war, although I think the historic comparisons are more comparable to 1968. Second, it is the first election where a woman is a top-tier contender from not only her party's nomination but for the presidency goes without saying, obviously. Third, it occurs in the midst of an acrimonious, unresolved debate about immigration, which is really a proxy debate about, um, a, for a broader definition of what it is to be an American in the 21st century. These are fundamental questions that go beyond, you know, should we build a, a border fence, right down to the level of, of who is an American in, in, in 2007. Um, fourth, it happens in a period of destructive animosity in our political discourse. Uh, although I think one source of this animosity, the inability of either national political party to establish a lasting beachhead in national politics, may be about to lessen a bit. Um, the fifth uh, fixed um, aspect of this campaign, I think, is for the first time ever, and I think this has been a lot undercovered, but it's going to get a lot of uh, coverage over the next year or so, um, the possibility that a relatively popular ex-president could return to the, to the White House albeit as first spouse. Uh, and that goes back to something Sandy alluded to earlier. Because of the Clintons and the Bushes, I think we're going to face a serious debate next year about, uh, you know, the, uh, about political dynasties that we have not seen since Franklin Roosevelt ran for his fourth term in 1944. And I think that, that whole aspect of the, of the campaign has is, is, is been undercover to this point. And sixth, um, we will face the longest presidential general election in history with the concurrent possibility that there actually may be more states with competitive elections on February 5th next year than on November 4th in the general election. Um, and that's because of the front-loading of the primary and caucus system led by Iowa and New Hampshire, but other states rushing in now, is going to create a situation where you could have 20 or more states competitive on February 5th in, in primary elections. And the last several general elections have essentially been fought in about 15 states. You know, legend has it that Ben Franklin, uh, who was a, a newspaper man among his many, many vocations and interests, I like to say probably after he got struck by lightning, um, was stopped by a group of citizens as he was leaving the Constitutional Convention. Someone asked him, what kind of government have you given us? Franklin is said to have replied, a republic if you can keep it. I think the challenge of 2007 is as great as anything Franklin foresaw two and a quarter centuries ago. A republic if we can keep it. And tonight, I'm here to defend mainstream media as a vital in that keeping. You know, much has been uh, written and debated, mostly inside my industry, about the death of newspapers and the decline of the so-called mainstream media, or as radio talk show host Laura Ingram calls us, the lamestream media. Um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of gloating on talk radio these days and in the blogosphere, and I'm sure you've seen it or heard it, uh, about, about the plight of an archaic, dinosauric mainstream media. Uh, MSM, they call it on, uh, in, 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 the, in the media blog par parlance. You know, and by now the litany of challenges is ever clear. Newspapers are de declining in readership. Failing newspapers, uh, are, you know, there's, there's competition for advertising dollars from new mediums with no illusions of public service journalism at all. Uh, changing reading and viewing habits, especially among echo boomers, um, which is, you know, who are predominant in the audience here tonight. Um, but it is a mistake, mistake and I, I would say a fundamental mistake, to view this condition solely as a news industry problem, or as a business problem of, of journalism, or as a threat only to publishers, or to big media conglomerates, or newspaper boards of directors. Every American of this and future generations has a direct stake in the survival of a probing, nonpartisan, and responsible community journalism. 
as journalism confront, confronts the technological and social changes confronting it, and as it focuses on the financial bottom line, we must not forget, we must never forget the civic bottom line that Franklin talked about. And we must do a better job of helping you, the American people, understand that our fates are intertwined. You know, I recently wrote a column that my editors headlined in defense of the mainstream. And I wrote about the change and the anxiety of many of my colleagues uh, in the newspaper business. And I ultimately concluded that if Americans won't get their news from new paper, newspapers anymore, so be it, and good for the trees. And bravo for the Internet's democratization of public discourse. No longer can you say it doesn't pay to argue with someone who buys ink by the barrel. I was never comfortable with that anyway. What worries me is that in focusing on the business and technical end of the information superhighway, the Internet, or whatever you want to call it, as my industry has done for the last 20 or so years, we have ignored a basic principle. At the end of the day, it has always been the quality of the cargo, not the way we deliver it, that has made American journalism vital and dynamic. And slashing newsroom budgets in an increasingly complex world ultimately devalues the cargo. It won't make any difference if the news is delivered by carrier pigeon or a microchip if it is not of value and the product of a vigorous journalism. And irrelevant journalism, I might add. You know, the University of Missouri recently released a study that uh, concluded that newspapers are un underspending in newsrooms and overspending in circulation and advertising. And the bottom line, and I quote from the report's author, said, if you lower the amount of money spent in the newsroom, then pretty soon the news product becomes so bad that you begin to lose money. The quality I am talking about emanates from basic principles of fairness, objectivity, rigorous analysis, and a willingness to confront wrongdoing where we see it. And when I say wrongdoing, I am not talking about the mindless transgressions of 15-minute celebrities that waste too much of our TV time these days, but what really counts in the greater wrongs of the world. Fairness, objectivity, confronting the real wrongs, illuminating paths to public decisions. This is the real work of mainstream media. It is also essential to a civil, self-governing society. If you doubt this, if you doubt this for a moment, ask yourself, why do dictators, what the, the first thing they do, throw independent, probing journalists in jail? You know, I must point out in talking about the blogosphere, though, that there are in, uh, important opinion blog sites out there now, like the Daily Coast, that, that does recognize the essential nature of our mainstream media business. But a lot of blog world hasn't yet realized that mainstream is not the sum total of a million ideological niches on the Internet any more than should be a byproduct of 20 or 30 percent profit margins. Mainstream is an ideal, an ethic. It is a belief that the melding of opinions, desires, and actions in a civil self-governing society is the true antidote to sectarian violence or genocide or dictatorship. Unfortunately, in recent years, Washington's definition of mainstream has been dumbed down to a false premise that equates rigidity with principle and compromise with sellout. With literally thousands of sophisticated interest groups using increasingly powerful abilities uh, to preach solely to their converted on narrow bands of issues, the constituency for a majority no longer exists except in the quadrennial calculations of campaign consultants. Is it any wonder that only one of our four, last four presidential winners got a majority of the popular vote? This is the considerable, considerable void that a mainstream media must help fill. It seems to me we have failed on two fronts. We too often buy into the two camps mentality on great issues facing the country, not searching hard enough for mainstream answers to problems like social security or stem cell research. And secondly, in this exciting time of exploding media in a post-gatekeeper post world, we have been AWOL in enlisting the American people and pre preserving this mainstream ethic. So my wish for my profession, tone down the tabletization. When did we become so cynical as to think Americans wanted wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the idle rich? <clears throat> Lead more, follow less. Public interest is not always best served by pandering to the latest survey, and to think so is not arrogance or indifference, but a compact with the public we serve. If you'd ask what you'd rather have, ice cream or carrots, the answer might be obvious. But would it be the right answer for your health? Stop being so defensive. We don't need to be loved, but our work will be respected if we do it fairly, honestly, and rigorously. And finally, remember the power of place, of being there in covering the news. You know, there's a big debate going on right now in my industry, in the courts, in the blogosphere, about who's a journalist. Technology is pushing the question. Uh, Wired Magazine recently put it, you know, when man bites dog, who's the first to report it? 
Don't assume it's your local paper or CNN anymore. Wired went on to point out that technology allows, quote, amazingly prolific non-professionals, end quote, to post instantaneous news online. And, and newsrooms across Gannett and in, in other companies are trying to embrace this uh, and engage this, what we call citizen journalism now, by, oper by opening portals for them and inviting two-way conversations on the news issues and trends. In South Korea, a new publication called Oh My News has 40,000 citizen reporters who file for a half million daily readers. This is a good thing if it illuminates and not just burns. But do these trends make us all reporters? I think not. If you catch, if you catch a spectacular car accident on your video phone and send it to Action News, you certainly have certain served witness to a newsy event. But only the reporter, by independently verifying the details and providing context, becomes the reporter. Who was at fault? Were there injuries? Was the road slippery? Were bad drivers involved? Was somebody famous in the car? I equate these distinctions to the difference between songwriting and karaoke. Reporters go where the news is. They try to see it in its total context, not just inside the frame of television or on YouTube. Journalists bring history and facts and ideas to the picture. If you just recorded what you saw and heard last week when President Akhmar Dinejad uh, spoke at Columbia University, you would have left your readers uh, or viewers with the conclusion that uh, his country, Iran, had no gay people, did not throw journalists or feminists in jail, did not put journalists to death as they do, that, the, that Iran's women were the freest in the world, even though they're, they're half a, a person under the, the, the Constitution. And the president, by the way, of the Columbia University was one rude man. It could have been a true depiction of an event, but it would not have been the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. The blogosphere it expands and sometimes even enriches the civic conversation in this country. But 99 times out of 100, they are working off a reporter's original notes. They wouldn't have anything to sing about otherwise. The challenge for my industry, it seems to me, is not in finding the medium for mainstream survival, but whether or not the ethic of the mainstream survives at all. One final note to students here tonight. Um, I'm trying very hard to resist the curmudgeon gene when I say this, but one change I, I noticed in, in young people coming to Washington over the last 25 years uh, people that I run into in Capitol Hill and elsewhere, um, these young people, I've always just liked the fact that they've arrived with the possibilities of service, opened ideas, and idealistic about what government could or could not do for Americans. This great American experiment from Franklin on has always counted on that youthful idealism to infuse this spirit and new ideas and vigor into our government and politics. It's one constant from Franklin's day. And don't get me wrong, I still see many of these traits in many, many young people that come to Capitol Hill. But I've also noticed another trend, and that is in the young people who come with what I call ideological chips on their shoulders, who view politics as pure combat, to vanquish the other side, to destroy the other side, and who seem to relish in exploiting the weaknesses and denying the very, very legitimacy of the opinions of others. They seem far too certain of the world for someone so young, and they are on both sides of the political aisle. They are not getting much help, by the way, from the so-called adult, adults in the room either. Uh, it doesn't help when the chairman of one of our national parties, a great political party, professes his actual hatred for members of the other party. Or when a leader of one party in Congress blames a competing ideology for all the social wrongs in America of the last 40 years. Both of those have occurred over the last five or six years in Washington. These mentalities lead to scorched earth tactics in our campaigns and in our legislative deliberations and I think an unhealthy prognosis for our survival as a nation. And so I would say to anyone entering the public square these days, keep an open mind. Not everything you believe today at 22 will be, or should be, what you believe when you are 40 or 60 or 80. Seek to know and to understand the world you inherit is infinitely larger than your self-interest. Jump in and swim for the mainstream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Our uh, schedule this evening does allow some time for questions and answers, and we have a large uh, group this evening. And so if uh, you do have a question for one of our speakers, uh, please uh, wave your hand so I can uh, spot you. And then if you would, please stand when you ask your question. Yes, sir.
are these on or do you want us uh, to come up to the we we can come up not carry anything thank you not carry anything from the uh, fact checks that are now popping up around the country trying to keep the rules of the game in force the first question was what should you as Iowans do to to um, keep the candidates honest I guess uh, this came up at a class that Chuck and I spoke at today about um, you know getting a, a, a candidate to answer a question and uh, the reporter's trick is to just keep asking it several times several ways until they answer it you all have this unique opportunity here to buttonhole them and you know hold their elbow unless they've got secret service like Hillary does um, and try to get them to answer that question that you have because believe me that opportunity will not exist once they leave New Hampshire Chuck, do it. Um, you know that's a good question some of so, some of our papers are doing that um, we have just launched a, a um, an information a, a election inf information site that has a lot of that stuff on it um, but the problem is and I, I will be brutally honest about this with 18 people out there giving you know 20 different speeches every day and you know and, and taking positions on issues it's just hard keeping stuff like that um, current and um, we're, we're throwing as many resources as we can at it but um, you know it's um, it, but but some of our papers have, have, have begun doing it so I'm sorry was there another I think Chuck answered his mm -hmm. Yes, could you please stand? I have it written down, but I'm not sure how the format of it. It goes, um, I think Ms. Johns, Mrs. Johnson, I'm sorry, you were talking about it. You say during the war of, in Vietnam, you say there were more journalists than now in the war in Iraq. Would you say the journalists then were more passionate to inform the public and so to society and that society also um, were more interested into that and also interested in news as overall in that well, were interested in news and also in the war then than they are interested in the news today. Well, gosh, I hope not, although I do believe that a certain amount of war fatigue begins to set in. In another year, this war will have lasted as long as World War II, which is sort of a shocking thing to think about. Um, but as to the first part of your question, in Vietnam, any enterprising reporter could jump on a helicopter with, uh, with a captain willing to take him to the front and get off with the troops, and the troops were accommodating to the reporters. And now you, you cannot go to the front unilaterally. It's just too dangerous. You know, if you're an American, whether you're an aid worker or a journalist or a soldier, you're a target in Iraq. So um, it leaves us at the mercy of um, being a military embed, uh, which uh, is a fine way to get to the front. But once you're there, they really don't want you to take photos or video of Americans being shot and killed. I, just to add to that, I think there's a, a good point um, that sort of relates to your question is um, journalists are treated differently in war these days than they were even during Vietnam. Um, there was, I wouldn't say it, it was an unwritten rule, but it was sort of almost a code of honor or the way wars were fought. The journalists weren't targets. Journalists now are targets. I had a friend who was killed in Bosnia in 1992 going back to help a wounded friend who was, and his car was clearly marked as a journalist car. He was unarmed, he, you know, whatever. And they, they actually set up ambushes for them. And so, you know, that's part of the psychological war now that's going on that, you know, it used to be that we were there as observers and now we're there as, as almost as much targets as the soldiers themselves. And, I, you know, the, the, the number of, of reporters, I don't know what, the, what it is, but it's, it's, it's startlingly high number of reporters who have actually been killed in Iraq. Chuck, I had a question for you before, mm -hmm. while someone formulates here. Could you tell that joke again? Which one? That turkey hunting joke. I, I, okay, well, you can tell it. You can tell it almost any way you want to. I, the first time I heard it was uh, economists. Um, three economists go turkey hunting, and one shoots to the right and misses, and the other one shoots to the left and misses, and the third one says, you got it. <laughs> it's pretty self-evident. It's pretty self-explanatory. So. 
sort of the imprecise any, nature of economics. All right, or I gave you a few more seconds to formulate a question. Any uh, any other questions from the? Uh, from well, the I pulled audience? this on the uh, on the class that we talked to today. But if you all want to be journalists someday, you have to learn how to ask questions. So. There's a question here, Mark. How do you think uh, media is changing with? Uh, more of the influence of pundits like Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck and Tucker Carlson and Keith Oberman and the media who report news but also have their own opinions uh, when they report it? Um, well, you know, I, I, I don't like it, um, but there's, you know, what can I do about it other than just to do, try to do my job as fairly. I, I don't think Bill O'Reilly is a journalist. I don't think, you know, most of the folks in that, I don't think he calls himself a journalist. Um, and, you know, to the degree that he gets an audience, he has an audience, and he is, um, you know, he, he's, he's very popular among conservatives in, in this country, and, and bully for him, but he's not an objective journalist. And um, if we ever get to the day where it's someone from the left screaming at the right, and that's the sum total of our journalism in this country, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not, it's not going to work very well. And, um, you know, as, as I tried to say in my remarks, you know, they're working off somebody else's script. I've never seen Bill O'Reilly at a camp, political campaign event. Um, you know, never. You know, but they, but they certainly opine about it, and you know, and that's 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 the power that they have. But you know, I would say that from you know nine o'clock on on cable news networks, there's very little news. Okay, I think that uh, that might take care of us uh, for questions this evening, and I think there uh, will be uh, some time to visit with the uh, speakers. Uh, before I uh, call uh, Michael back forward, I uh, would like to once again to invite you to uh, thank our speakers this evening. <laughs> Michael? When I uh, reported for United Press International, I would always see the reporters that, you know, were trying to get back to the newsroom, and then you'd save the most important point to tell those. Like, if you leave, Boucher finds out who you are, and you don't get that extra credit. <laughs> see, there they are. They, 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 they turned around. Hey. Oh, we do have uh, some awards uh, to give tonight. And I, I do want to thank uh, David Bula, Chet Harms, Dennis Chamberlain, SPJ, and all you wonderful students for coming out here. Uh, it is, uh, what you heard tonight is more important than you might realize uh, in both of our speakers. Uh, we want to present to you with a, a token of our gratitude, and we're going to start with uh, you, Brian, as our first Chamberlain Fellow. If you'd come up and, and take this, we would be mighty pleased. Thank you for all your, your wonderful <laughs> Well, I have uh, one for Sandy and, and one for Chuck. And this one here is for Chuck, and it says, The Chamberlain Lex Lecture Series, Defending the Mainstream Media. Thank you so, thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> and Sandy, you know that this is yours. <laughs> and it also... Uh, cite you as one of our lecturers and the First Amendment in politics. Thank, thank you, you so much. Right. Thank you so much. But that's, that's not all. Because Jane Peterson notes something that we have in common with South Dakota State, and that is a hard hat journalism. So we're going to give this to Sandy first, and she can determine who gets to wear it in the house. I know the logo has changed, but we're mighty partial to size. So we practice hard hat journalism here, just as we did at South Dakota State. Thank you and have a good evening.